This video is about orthopedic emergencies and we will be focusing on open fractures and compartment syndrome. This video is for educational purposes only. Let's start off with discussing open fractures. Open fractures are fractures with direct communication to the external environment. There is extensive soft tissue injury. Bones in soft tissue are likely to be contaminated, putting the individual at high risk for infection. The Gustlow anderson classification is used to grade open fractures from grade 1 to 3. The criteria for grading include the energy of the injury, size of the wound, extent of contamination, local skin coverage, and neurovascular injury. Grade 1, low energy with minimum soft tissue injury, no contamination, and a simple fracture. Grade 2, moderate energy, contamination, and comminution. Grade 3, there is extensive energy, contamination, comminution, and soft tissue injury. Grade 3B, additionally requires a skin flap. 3C, has associated neurovascular injury. It is important to note that the extent of contamination, necessity for skin flap, and presence of neurovascular injury are defining features when classifying open fractures. For example, a wound of less than 1 cm with neurovascular injury is considered grade 3C. You can use the mnemonic OPEN to help you remember the management. First, you need to make sure that the patient is okay by making use of the ATLS principles. Based on the Gustula Anderson classification, grade 1 and 2 receive monotherapy, grade 3 receives triple therapy. Giving antibiotics early has a massive influence on outcome of the fracture and subsequent complications such as chronic osteitis. According to evidence, a delay of more than 3 hours results in poor outcome. Continue antibiotics until 24 hours after final closure. Anti-tetanus toxoid is given based on previous doses that the patient has received and the extent of their wound. This is described in the table. Remember that your patient is in pain, so give analgesia. As part of the preparation for surgery, the wound needs to be cleaned with a brief washout and removal of large debris. Then cover with a sterile saline soaked dressing. The fracture needs to be reduced and immobilized with a splint as this decreases pain, further soft tissue injury and thrombus formation. Investigations such as x-rays can be obtained. The next step is to excise in surgery. Aggressive debridement of foreign material, bone fragments and non-viable soft tissue is done. You then irrigate with saline of more than 3 litres depending on the classification. External fixation is indicated so that the wound can be monitored and treated. A vacuum dressing can then be applied following the principle of delayed wound closure. Relook at 24 to 48 hours, checking the state of the wound. If it is satisfactory, definitive wound closure can be done. If it requires further debridement, clean it and send a pus swab for testing. External fixation is preferred because internal fixation poses the risk of deep infection and compromises blood supply to the bone. Post-op, check soft tissue healing, remove X-fix and apply POP. At the follow-up, check fracture healing and union and then refer to physio. Now let's discuss compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome is defined as a rising tissue pressure within a closed osteofascial compartment. This exceeds perfusion pressure and then results in nerve and muscle ischemia. Compartment syndrome most commonly occurs in injuries along the tibia, forearm and hand. The initiating factor in compartment syndrome is increased contents, which leads to raised compartment pressure. This can be exacerbated by decreased compartment size. Once the compartment pressure is greater than the capillary pressure, there is no capillary exchange, which leads to ischemia and extravasation, worsening the compartment pressure. Once compartment pressure is greater than venous pressure, there is venous outflow obstruction, worsening the events. Thereafter, arteriolar inflow may be compromised. Patients with compartment syndrome often present with pain out of keeping with the injury. On examination, you may find palpable swelling, a tense woody compartment, and pain on passive stretch. These are early signs and should not be missed. Late signs include paresthesia, paralysis, and pulselessness. At this point, the damage may already be irreversible. Time is of the essence. 
At two hours, reversible nerve changes occur. At four hours, reversible muscle ischemia and eudopraxia. And at six hours, there's irreversible damage. Remember, diagnosis is made clinically. However, intracompartmental monitoring can be used in high-risk patients, such as patients who are unable to communicate reliably. These could be infants, patients with low GCS, and those who are intoxicated. Another group includes those with polytrauma and in patients who have inconclusive findings. Now let's discuss treatment using the tibia as an example. Remove external pressure. The first step is to bivalve the pop by splitting it along the lateral and medial aspects. Also, remove all tight dressings. If after 15 minutes there is no improvement of symptoms, a fasciotomy is indicated. Conscious sedation and local anesthetic is required. All four compartments need to be released surgically. For the anterior and lateral compartment, make a 15 cm incision in the cutaneous layer. Then make two horizontal incisions in the fascia and further release each compartment. Take care not to damage the superficial peroneal nerve. Repeat on the posterior medial side to release the superficial and deep posterior compartments. Do not damage the saphenous nerve and vein. Post-operative management, you need a dressing change and delayed primary closure or skin grafting at 3 to 7 days. Thank you for watching our video. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, UCT Teach.